Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Shall we start today's session with the recitation of Al-Fatiha? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Malik yamuddin. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Ihdina as-sirata al-mustaqim. Sirata al-lazina an'amta alayhim. Ghayri ma'dudi alayhim. Walad-dalim. Amin. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Assalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya wa mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yasir li amri wa ahlul uhdatan min lisani yafkahu kawli Ya assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to everyone You're welcome to today's webinar Praise be to Allah as you can see outside It is such a beautiful morning Alhamdulillah and the temperature also is very cooling. So the morning in Shalam today is very nice, Alhamdulillah. So I welcome all of you to today's webinar and thank you for spending your precious time to be with us uh, this morning. A special thank to our distinguished and honorable speaker, our Dr. Siti Awamza, for her willingness to be with us also Although her schedule, I know, is very, very tight. So how are you, Dr. Siti? You okay? Alhamdulillah, fine. Thank you, Prof. Zul. Okay. So let me just first introduce myself. My name is uh, Zulkifli Yusof. I'm a faculty member in the Construction, Business and Project Management Division under the Faculty of Civil Engineering, UITM, University Technology Mara. I have been asked to moderate this webinar today in my capacity as the chairman of the Context Problem Committee in my faculty of civil engineering. So this a committee uh, was formed back in 2015, basically to address the findings of our EAC reaccreditation exercise in late 2013. The exercise found significant shortcomings with respect to the fulfillment of a complex engineering problem and engineering activities required by EAC. So, the function of the committee is basically to ensure our engineering program will completely and effectively fulfill the complex engineering problem and engineering activities requirement as stipulated engineering program learning outcomes. So we have more than five years experience, extensive one, yeah, on the ground, which we hope to share with all of, all of you in our future webinars, and also in a book that we hope to be published by October this year. And of course, not to forget the immense contribution by our speaker today, who happened to be one of my committee members and he was still with UITM, but she was still with UITM. So coming to today's webinar topic, acculturation of OBE, alternative assessment, adherence to complex engineering problem and complex engineering activities. So there are basically three elements in this topic. The first one is the acculturation of OBE. So there may be some contention here but as far as EAC is concerned, from their perspective, we have reached the stage of acculturation of OBE. But for some universities, may be at an earlier stage, may be lagging behind a bit. So this may be a contention here. Second element is the alternative assessment. With the coming of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, all of us have had to come up with alternative assessment. Be it we have opted for open book examination or we have replaced our examination with uh, assignments and a coursework, sorry, our projects. So there are challenges that confront us when we make this change or this transfer. 
And of course, the third element of this topic today is adherence to complex engineering problem and complex engineering activities. So even before the COVID-19 pandemic, we already had challenges in actually trying to adhere to the complex engineering problem and complex engineering activities in our assessment, be it whether we choose to do it in our assignments, projects, or in our final exams. But with the coming of this COVID-19 pandemic, I think the challenges have somehow uh, doubled yeah, in trying to adhere to these uh, requirements. So today's seminar, sorry, webinar, is organized by the Academic Office and the Construction Business and Project Management Division of Faculty of Civil Engineering, University of Technology Mara, Shala, and also with the Civil Engineering Department at our Penang Branch Campus. So our technical person today, Dr. Sohaila from Penang. So you're okay, Dr. Sohaila? So monitoring all three platforms today, live streaming at YouTube, Facebook, and uh, of course, Google Meet. I will be monitored by Dr. Hazrina and Dr. Chimazda. And most importantly, worth noting today is the selfless and tireless effort by the key person who is hosting our webinar today, who have made this session today possible, none other than engineer Dr. Chimazda Matisa. So thank you, Dr. Chimazda. So the half rule for today, the talk will be about 45 minutes. Then we will open the session to question and answer at 11 for around 45 minutes. So questions shall, shall be submitted on writing. Please take your name and university and questions should be related to today's topic. So let me, let me now introduce to our speaker for today. So our Dr. Siti Hau Hamza was formerly the Professor of Civil and Structural Engineering at the Faculty of Civil Engineering, University of Technology, Mara, Shahala. So she has been a colleague of mine since 1984, but she retired in 2017. And since she has been appointed as the Director of EAD, the Engineering Accreditation Department, and ETAD, Board of Engineers Malaysia, since year, this year, 2020 until 2022. So Dr. Siti Hauer is truly, I can say, a Sifu in today's topic. And she has been involved in OBE and of course in uh, EAC for as long as I can remember. She has become a panel of an EAC and today she is with us to share share on the topic of the cooperation of OBE, alternative assessment, adherence to complex engineering problems, and complex engineering activities. So I welcome Dr. Siti. And that is yours, Dr. Siti. Thank you very much, Prof. Zul. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning to everyone. It is nice um, to be able to have this morning to share the experiences with UITN. Uh, and thank you to Dr. Mazna and all the committee members who have made this possible. And for the faculty to have actually been able to host this particular session. Um, this is basically um, an effort that is ongoing. I started first with UNIMAS and then shortly later uh, UMS uh, called me in and then uh, we also have a representation with UUM and uh, recently was with uh, UTM. So the opportunity that we have with webinar is we are able to cater for a larger crowd and we're able to get uh, everyone on board and there were a lot of questions that every time when I have this particular session. And it's very good that uh, UITM and even UTM uh, managed to share this with the public. And this is also an uh, applaud uh, to the faculty. 
So first of all, I uh, would like to congratulate the whole team for able to bring it this up. And then I will be sharing with you the latest uh, uh, output from our IEM 2020 meeting that was held in, uh, supposedly to be held in South Africa, but it was actually done on video conferencing. So without further ado, since I have about 40 minutes left, so may I have the first uh, presentation um, document, Dr. Mazna? What I would like to bring the attention of all is on the guiding principle. And this guiding principle, uh, at the time when we developed this guiding principle, it was a call that we made and it was uh, chaired by Prof. Nolida. Prof. Nolida is on board. And when we come up with this guiding principle, the basis of the guiding principle is to go on the mood that alteration of outcome-based education. Acculturation means that we should be saying that majority of the program are mature in outcome-based education. So when we move on, we were providing some guiding principle on the teaching, learning and assessment and implementation during COVID-19. I believe at that time, um, I think the architect, uh, Lembaga Architect uh, Negara and uh, Lembaga Architect Malaysia were also coming out with a guiding principle. So what we did here was to really focus on five elements of our teaching, learning and assessment. But let me draw your first attention to our 2.1, I think. Can you scroll up so that we can, yeah. 2.1 is saying that all programs are to ensure attainment of the 12 program outcomes as stipulated in the manual or the standards. So I think all of the lecturers here on board, especially in Malaysia, you should know that we are now guided by our new standards or revised standard. We have standard 2020 and it is, has been effective since the 1st of May 2020. So there are certain elements of this particular standards that you must pay attention to. For instance, for uh, EAC, we have the implementation or basically a strict implementation of our 3 PE or the 30% PE. And we also have a strict implementation of significant number of our laboratory should be under OEL. So it should be open under laboratory. So what is significant? Significant can be more than 50%. So we expect that most of the laboratory work should be done on uh, uh, open-ended uh, system. However, once we go through the alternative assessment method that we have and in compliance to WP, you will realize that by right, all the laboratory work can be done using the open-ended system under the characteristics of WP. Now, <clears throat> under 2.1, it mentioned all, all alternative assessment must be designed or formulated based on the intended learning outcome. Therefore, by right during COVID-19, we should not change our learning outcome. The learning outcome is the same because that has been our recipe. What may change is the assessment. Probably our previous assessment was having a face-to-face -face final exam. Now we need to change the final exam component into something else. Is it going to be an open book exam? Or is it going to be changed to as a PBL, which is still considered as a final exam? Because bear in mind, when we talk about assessment, when you talk about assessment, there are the formative assessment and there are the summative assessment. Anything summative that we always park as a final exam would comprise the whole 14 weeks or whatever, 12 weeks or maybe 10 weeks of study. And all of that learning outcome that is being designed for within that particular semester or within that particular quarter will be tested at the end of the semester or at the end of the quarter. And that examination is known as a summative exam. And that can be done in the form of a final exam or it can be done also in the form of other kind of alternative assessment which will cater for the summative result. So in this case, we also mentioned scenario or case study types of questions, 
could be used as alternative to the psychomotor and affective POs during the COVID-19 pandemic. Please understand this particular statement rightly because it do mention that during the COVID-19 pandemic. When we talk about psychomotor and affective domain, probably some of the psychomotor domain that you will get from your laboratory work would require you to do the real hands-on, the physical part of it. But somehow or other, because the laboratory session happened to fall during COVID-19 pandemic MCO, where you have the movement control order and students are not allowed to be in the students are not allowed to be in the university. So thus, how can you really offer alternative assessment to the psychomotor domain? This is where I receive lots of questions. Will simulation be good enough? Yes, simulation can be used, but not all of the psychomotor domain can be done on simulation. So if you can't do the psychomotor domain via simulation, what should we do now? Are we saying that that's okay? Or are we saying that we should also provide gap analysis? So what EAC wants to see is are you providing that gap analysis? Most probably what you will do is you will provide all of those laboratory work on simulation. Students may do some computer simulation work or maybe do some kind of experiment via this uh, computer modeling that they have. But if they do not have that feel and if they don't really do it, you know that they are not getting the proper learning outcome, the intended learning outcome that was already designed in that particular course. So now things are getting better. Students are getting back into the university. There's nothing wrong by asking students to repeat those particular assessments. This time around, by doing the experiment, and even if the grade has been given out, there's nothing wrong by giving them to put up a reflection paper and get the understanding whether they are really learning and they are attaining all the learning outcome that it is intended for in that particular course. At the end of the day, if this psychomotor domain is affecting year one or year two student, bear in mind students are going to undergo final year project. They may require these particular skills before they could actually embark on their final year project. So the gap analysis is something that EAC ETEC would like to see in the SAR document. Um, or rather, you will be undergoing your continuing cycle and you will also be undergoing your new program, sorry, a new cycle uh, uh, visit. Therefore, you will have to have a special uh, section explaining what is the TLA that had been conducted, how is the QMS done internally, to address the COVID-19 pandemic. So the TLA is saying that you are doing the psychomotor domain and the affective domain by simulation, and you know that it is really important, especially for the technologies program and the diploma program, then they must do some gap analysis for this particular assessment that we have not been able to do during the COVID-19. And this particular mention is only during COVID-19 pandemic. Now that students are now allowed to go back into the campus, so by right, we should be saying that between one to two semesters of learning is affected for psychomotor and affective. And if students are about to graduate, then maybe you can't do much, but definitely there will be an impact. And it is good for the faculty to study this particular impact, whether they are really getting all these intended learning outcome during the COVID-19 if you do our learning via online, all right? So that is one uh, uh, item that I need to highlight, 2.1. And you must also realize that any mention of the accreditation, it shall not be compromised. So in whatever uh, alternative assessment that you are using, therefore you must ensure that the accreditation must not be compromised. So can we go um, 2.2, if you look at 
All programs are advised to implement substantial equivalent assessment to the current assessment. It's not saying that you can go away with whatever alternative assessment that we have. I do have questions asking, can we just go by a multiple choice question for our final exam? Can we do that? And can that be considered as equivalent assessment to the current assessment? I think it is fair for the university to ask your internal quality system whether that is really a good alternative to your assessment in comparative to your current assessment. Because if you ask us at EAC, what we are looking at, how do you really attain your SUA program outcome? If you think that your MCQ is good, go ahead with your MCQ. But then again, like I said, is it really substantial equivalent assessment to the current assessment? How can you change something that you are really going to go for PBL with a multiple choice question? So I think uh, that would, uh, would, would require some so you can really go ahead and have your MCQ uh, for your uh, uh, final examination paper. So the continuous assessment implemented could be continued with take-home exams and assignments. When we talk about take-home exams and assignment, that is also another thing. Right? You need to realize whether it is going to attain accordingly as what we have mentioned in 2.1. The program is expected to undertake precautionary measures in handling integrity issues. This is also another issue that uh, we, address, we at the uh, university need to realize how do we handle integrity issues. Do you get the students to sign the pledge? Do you look at uh, whether students are supposedly to have everything to be done with the video on and so forth? So therefore, it is not um, um, not possible really to cater for issues and Yeah. Yeah. Can everyone please mute their mic? We're getting echoes here. Doctor Chan Chan Han Sen, please mute your mic, please. Thank you. Okay, all right. So shall we move to, uh, yeah, 2.3 is also another issue. How do you ensure that all the students, all students, I'm saying here all students, at least have a minimum access to all the e-learning system? So I think we've heard recently the case of a uh, uh, student who has to climb a tree just to get the internet connection. That is how poor it is. And she has to sit for her final exam. So that is a situation that we have in our country. So how can the university ensure that all of the students are getting that? And if you want to give a final exam, which is supposedly to be a take-home exam or, or, or online exam, how many hours do you think is good? Would there be any disruption of internet line connectivity? Will it take like one hour to download all the uh, graphic? And how long will it take for them to upload back to your platform so that they can submit their examination answers? So all of these questions in 2.3 is under the purview of the university. We at EDAC will just do the triangulation with the students, whether they are having problem with this or not. And if they are having problem, then we see that universities are not really addressing this particular issue rightly. Yeah, because otherwise you're, you will go in, you will, or you will definitely affect your TLE, your teaching, learning and assessment. Okay, in 3.0, you will see that we have only highlighted five main uh, issues. The first one is the final year project. Uh, we do have questions about how does the final year project to be done if it is not going to be able to be uh, done in the laboratory. So we consider that any ongoing final year project at the final semester, if they are focusing on the experimental project, and still be carried out with possibility of extension of time to complete. This is uh, in due recognition between the supervisor and the student. 
However, if they feel that uh, they need to change that into a simulation, then everything has to be realigned properly for a simulation work to obtain the intended uh, program outcome. Yeah, so we already have um, highlighted this uh, under final year project. Industrial training, I think for the bachelor degree, bachelor engineering program, it wouldn't be much an issue because we have given the jurisdiction of if it is halted and students need to continue after semester eight, then it is possible for them to do so because it's only affecting about eight weeks of uh, duration. So then it can be done. For those who have done two weeks and the remaining six weeks is done under WFH, that is work from home, that is also possible. However, when you talk about the diploma program and the technology program, then the university or the program has to give a deeper thought on whether students have actually attained the intended practice oriented component for technology and for the diploma. Yeah, because the diploma would definitely have to go for 16 weeks and the, uh, the minimum of 12 weeks uh, for the degree is a 24 weeks. So therefore it's a long duration, so therefore they really need to identify whether they have actually uh, achieved the intended hmm. outcome. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, the next one will be on the courses with extensive laboratory work. I think I've discussed this a bit when I mentioned about 2.1. Next, we can go on the integrated design project. This is again another issue that has been discussed quite a lot because it mentioned about the teamwork effort. How can the teamwork effort and the complex engineering activities characteristics to be carried out? We are not giving you any prescriptive on this, any prescription on this, but the university is supposed to come out on means and ways on how to identify teamwork effort and complex engineering activities are continued accordingly. Because this is done to assess teamwork. PO, one of the PO is addressing on teamwork. So therefore, you need to address this accordingly. Okay. Uh, similarly, for IDP, if you can't, for some, probably for mechanical, for electrical, they need to come up with prototype. So probably at this time around, they would only be able to produce their prototype design and equivalent. They could have done some uh, simulation work through some computer software. And then again, if you need to realize some of the computer software is only available on the, at the university ground on the campus. And it can only be available through Infranet. So these kind of computer software, which is not available where students is at their own home ground, must also be looked at on how these are possible to be replaced with some other softwares. Probably some of the intended learning outcome or the program outcome do specify certain kind of softwares. Probably if I say that uh, in our IDP, we say that students need to use esteem. We don't have esteem uh, for, for, for student uh, 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 license, then students may not be able to use esteem. So then again, these are the activities that the universities must relook into on how the alternative assessment can be used to address whatever has been mentioned in the intended learning outcome or in the program outcome. Okay, 3.5 is the most important section, which is the final exam. I think uh, most of you have done your final exam and some may, uh, under, some may undergo their final exam now. And the recent talk that we had with UTM was actually focusing on open book examination. I hope some of you have been able to, to view that particular webinar. And I think if you can't, you can actually try to write to a CEE UTM and request for their recorded uh, version. And you can actually check back on uh, how the final examination using open book examination valid as a cons consideration for the final exam. All right. So these are basically the, the main function of our guiding principle. And we specifically mentioned only on these five items. And all of these five items will also have a relation to our 
uh, WP and also our EA. And uh, this has been uh, used um, quite extensively. And for those who are actually undergoing new cycle, uh, probably words have spread around for all the new cycle program. Uh, they are supposed to submit their SAR, their own SAR, the five years or the six years ago SAR, plus the supplemental document addressing what is their TLA according to our guiding principle. So we are going to bring all those new cycle accreditation uh, on board our ADM, which is supposedly to be on the 15th, and we will consider of giving them a one-year blanket accreditation. Therefore, their expiration of 2020 will now be bring over to 2021. So we will not be doing any accreditation to all the new cycle, but we will only proceed with the new program and only the deferred cases. So that will reduce our operation uh, this particular year because of COVID-19. So this particular guiding principle have been uh, a good uh, indicator to how our, uh, our industry or our stakeholder is taking seriously about the alternative assessment. Is there any question? I will take one or two questions first, uh, Prof. Zul, if there is any with respect to this guiding principle. Or you want me to proceed to the uh, alternative assessment? Okay, we will proceed. Okay. Uh, so we will proceed with these slides. I think I have about 15 slides. Okay. Now, we are looking at the alternative assessment, adherence to WP and EA. It is, it is, trust me, it is basically very simple to go to WP and EA. And for all of our POs that we are addressing, we are actually addressing WP and EA. We can go to the next slide. Now, assessment provide adequate feedback to the program to identify strengths and weaknesses for CQI. Under outcome-based education, even though we achieve strength, we still have to go for CQI. Doesn't mean that if it's already strong, we don't have to go for CQI. How can we make it stronger? Okay. And obviously, any weaknesses has to be relooked and revisited and review so that it will not fall under weaknesses anymore. So it can go into the uh, strength or probably some opportunity for improvement. So prior to this, we have face-to-face -face assessment. Now we are going into the alternative assessment. So I give some, some example of maybe take-home simulation and how do you uh, address teamwork and how you're going to address environment. Okay. For today, I will just uh, discuss on take-home and simulation. And uh, we can always discuss this uh, at any other time later. Uh, you can always just email me if you need some, uh, some, some clarification on how EAC will look at teamwork and also environment. Most importantly, we are looking at the quality assurance. All of the universities and all of the program has your own internal QMS. So at EAC, at ETEP, we are looking at how you address all the quality assurances and all the CQI that is going to be conducted in your program. Can we look at the next slide? Basically, these are the two outcomes. The two outcomes looking at how we're going to look at the characteristics of WP and EA and how is the alternative assessment fulfilling the WP and EA characteristic. So I think these are over and over again that you are looking at it. And uh, let me introduce you. There will be another WK coming up. Yeah. Okay, that's a surprise, which will be part to the end of the uh, session. Okay, next slide. Well, over and over, we are looking at constructive alignment. Why? Because the main core business here is the student. Student must get the learning outcome and they must be facilitated to attain the learning outcome. And how do we ensure that students are getting the learning outcome? We have to go through the assessment. So assessment here is directly impacted through the WP and also EA. So WP is a complex problem. 
And EA is a complex engineering activities. It can come whether in the form of formative or summative, direct or indirect, even at the course level or even at the program level. So most importantly is how is the instruction happening in class? If you are going for PBL, problem-based learning, would your assessment at that point of time going to be formative or is it going to be summative? Probably when you are having your class, it will be more of a formative. Probably at that point of time, PBL, you are looking at teamwork effort. You don't have to really measure at that point that whether they already have attained the teamwork uh, outcome or not. While you are still forming them, so probably you will only gauge it when they are submitting their final year report or their final semester report or the report or the final report for the PBL work. Then only you would gauge their teamwork effort. Or probably some other element, probably ethics. So at the point when they are starting doing their work under the uh, blended learning, right? You will still consider them to say that you must be online. I must see your face. I should not have uh, your video being taken off. I must see your face. So if I have 200, I have 240 participants here. So all of the 240 participants must show their face. Because I want to check whether you are really there. Right? Blended learning will require some kind of online learning. So how will you know whether your students are there? There as in the place where they're supposed to receive learning. They could be there or they could not be there. Right? So therefore, you also need to look at the possibility of gauging the ethics part. So probably in the beginning of the semester, in the beginning of the uh, few weeks, you will just look at the formative aspect. But later, you would have to gauge it in terms of the summative uh, component. So we will look at the constructive alignment. Please bear in mind the what, the how to help, and how to know must always be there. And therefore, WP and EA will come in. All right. Okay, next. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, you are very familiar with this. Currently, this is what we are uh, dealing with. PO1 right up to PO7 will have its own WK. And all of PO1 to PO7 is the program outcome that have to address complex problem solving or complex problem or complex engineering problem or known as WP. It has WK, WK is a knowledge profile. And then we have PO number 10, which is con uh, communication. PO 10 is communication. And PO 10 on communication is addressing complex engineering activities. So if you realize WK1 right up to WK7, K1, sorry, WK1 right up to WK8 is all being addressed in PO1 right up to PO8. PO8 is not complex, but it has to address WK7. But soon after, in 2021, you will see this change. So therefore, there could be some changes that we need to make in our PO uh, mapping as well. So, but we have to wait until 2021. I'm giving you a preview of what is going to happen. Yeah? Okay, next slide. Okay, this is the slide that contains all the important uh, jargon. Okay, WK, WK1 right up to WK8. And remember WK1 is natural science. It's no longer phys physical sciences. It is natural science. And we have mathematics. And then later you will see this mathematics will also change in the 2021. And then we have the engineering fundamentals, specialist knowledge, engineering design, practice, comprehension, and research literature. WP, I think uh, we have already gone through this many times, where WP is the in-depth engineering knowledge which must address WK3, 4, 5, 6, or 8. And WP1 is a must-have. So it is a must-have of all the WKs that we'll see in the column on the left. Right? 
And then some or all. Some or all means some. How many do you consider some? I would take minimum of two. Two. So anyone between WP2 to WP7. So two. So I will have one coming from WP1, another two coming from WP2 to WP7. Anyone, any two of them. So in total, each PO will have to address at least three WP. That's the minimum. Okay. Similarly with EA, however, EA do not have any compulsory characteristics. It has all the five EAs characteristic, but it don't have any compulsory. So you just have to address some or all. Some or all means you can just address two or all of them. Minimum is two. So now, let us give our focus to WP. If you see WP, we have WP2 as conflicting. That is wide ranging and conflicting. WP3 is no obvious solution. WP4 is infrequently used, familiarity. WP5 is on the codes. WP7 is on stakeholder, that means diverse groups of stakeholders. And WP7 is on the interdependence. Okay, how can we address all of this? Into our final exam or into our alternative assessment. Okay, let's move on to the next slide okay basically this is the gist of everything p01 2 3 4 5 it's easy to go with anything on analysis of problems and synthesis of solution anything on po6 po7 and po8 is to go on responsibility so therefore the mode of questions that you will ask is more on responsibilities it's best to go easiest to go on that way and W, uh, PO9, PO10, PO11 and PO12, no doubt that some can be done in, in cognitive domain, especially PO11. But then PO9 and PO10 and PO12 will require the students to be able to show them how they really deal with teamwork. Now, under communication, we have, remember, we have the EA. And communication can go whether it's by verbal or is going to go by presentation. Now, even under uh, 2021 later, communication is being parked on with a, a, a larger scope of how to communicate with the stakeholder. It's not just with verbal and uh, paperwork. So, but for now, it is going to be as such. And how do you actually address this as an alternative assessment? And how do you really address them as complex engineering activities. Okay, next. Okay, let's go with the alternative assessment and we'll go with open book. We'll start first with open book, yeah? So if you go to the next slide. Okay, I am putting this slide again because I need to use this slide together with the other slide. Okay, next slide. Okay, now, supposedly now I have an open book exam and I am addressing PO2 and PO3, okay? So if you look under PO2, PO2 would have to address WK1, WK2, WK3, WK4, right? But in PO2, it is also addressing complex, Problem solving. So we need to address WP1. So which of the WK that can be addressed in PO number two? So what is PO number two? PO number two is analysis of problem, right? Problem solving. So therefore, what is WK3? WK3 is anything to be on fundamentals, right? And what is WK4? WK4 is on the uh, specialist knowledge. So if I need to address WP1 for PO number two in my final exam, and it is an open book exam, therefore 
I must be sure that I am addressing WK3 and WK4. The reason being because it is synonym to PO number 2. Okay. Now, when you talk about what is the next WP that need to be addressed, because you already have addressed WP1, so probably I will look at WP2, which is range of conflicting requirements. And I can also address WP3. What is WP3? Which is the depth of analysis. So if I am looking at my row for PO number 2, I have addressed the minimum expected by EAC. WP1, I am addressing WK3 and WK4. For WP, I am addressing WP2 and WP3. Reason being because it is associated with PO number 2. But then, if the cost is also addressing PO number 3, so if you look at PO number 3, what is the compulsory WK that PO number 3 must have? It must have WK5, right? So if it has to have WK5, therefore, I don't have to add any more WK to my WP1 compulsion. Because I've already addressed WK5. WP1 says that I must address WK3, WK4, WK5, WK6 and WK8. So if I am addressing PO number 3, it's good enough that I will only cater for WK5. I don't have to measure my WK3 and WK4. Even though it is necessary for the students to arrive before they can answer WK5. That's fine. That is indirectly, they need to do all of those prior to getting to WK5. But for the purpose of measurement, they can just go on WK5. Now, what else do I need? You will realize that PO number 3 is addressing on design. So, when we are addressing for design, then which is the best WP that we can map it to? Definitely is WP5 because what is WP5? WP5 is extent of applicable codes. When you talk about extent of applicable codes, it mentioned here are uh, outside problems encompassed by standards and course of practice for professional engineering. Probably if you have this particular question in probably in geotech, okay, in geotech, and you are asking student to design a reinforced, retain, reinforced concrete retaining wall. You can also get the student to provide an alternative design to check on the cost which is cheaper if they want to go with any reinforced earth retaining wall or they want to go with any rubble wall or they want to go with any other method that they thought is possible and that can be used with respect to using the manufacturing detail we have so many manufacturers detailed that can be used to solve that particular problem. Or probably rather than designing a concrete water tank, why don't they use whatever water tank that is available in the market that can be ready to install? And that installation would require some kind of design before they could actually Reinstall all those that is prefabricated water tank. And that would qualify for the W5 under PO number 3. But if you are just addressing WP5, there is only one that you are addressing between WP2 to WP7. So you can choose. You can choose some other WPs. But for this particular exercise, I am suggesting WP2. 
which WP2 is talking about range of conflicting requirements. So range of conflicting requirement WP2 and WP5 is good enough with WK3 being considered to assess PO number 3 if you're having an open board exam. Even if you have having any PBL. Because at the end of the day, I'm sure you are capable of handling the integrity issues here. Because when you're giving anything of a different conflicting requirement, each group will have different requirement. Therefore, you don't have any issues of them copying each other. Even when you request for a different kind of uh, uh, construction design or any kind of other alternative design, they are using different sort of applicable codes. So that would also address the WK5 and also the WP5. Okay. Similarly, if you look at PO number six, what is PO number six? PO number six is on. Uh, what is PO number six, Cik Mazda? <laughs> No, I suddenly I've forgotten PO number six. But PO number six is addressing WK7. Okay. PO number six is addressing uh, WK7. What is WK7? WK7 is on comprehension. So when you talk about comprehension, okay, what is WP6 and WP7? WP6 is extent of stakeholder involving and level of conflicting requirements. And WP7 is interdependence. So I can look on WP06, which is addressing WK7. And WK7 is a must-have WK for that particular PO. So if you look in this particular table, I've already highlighted all in blue by saying that all of those are the compulsory PO. Uh, can we move back to the slide before this? Yeah. Okay, on PO number 6, so the PO number 6 is addressing WK7 and PO7 is also addressing WK7 and PO8 is also addressing WK7. So all of these POs which is addressing WK7 is a compulsory WK that must be addressed and it is on comprehension. So as what I've already given and uh, shown you uh, with an example here on PO6, PO6 on comprehension, I address WP6 and WP7. Why WP6? Because it is stakeholder involvement. So you need to comprehend matters and you need to deliver them to the stakeholders, to diverse group of stakeholders. And also under in interdependence, it becomes high level problems, including many components, parts or sub parts. So it is important to understand because why comprehension is really necessary for PO6, PO7 and PO8. Okay, now PO8 is definitely on ethics, right? And if you see that some of those that is being addressed in here, basically all the WKs that is being addressed in the POs is a compulsory WKs that had been mentioned basically in our program outcome. So that you don't have to add more of them. If you want to, for instance, like if you want to increase uh, WK uh, instead of just WK7 in PO6, you want to go with WK4, which is on the specialist, specialist knowledge, you can. Or if you want to go PO6 with WK8, you still can do it. For now, I am just parking WK7 to it. If, even if you just have WK7 for your PO6, it is already valid. And the EAC is already valid because it has addressed one of the component of WP1. The most importantly that you must realize, between PO1 to PO7, it must address WK3 right up to WK8. Regardless of where the PO is going to be. Yeah? And then again, if you look at the WP, the other component of WP, WP2 right up to WP7, basically that you will see that two WP characteristics is being addressed to each of the POs. I'm not saying that this is cast in stone. You can still change it, but somehow or other the one in the blue highlights cannot be changed. You can add to top up, yes. 
but those minimum in the blue highlights cannot be changed for this particular uh, POs, PO3, PO4, PO6, sorry, PO5, PO6 and PO7 and also PO8. Okay, now if you go to the next uh, slide, the next slide would say that on computer simulation, if you are dealing with computer simulation and what is PO5? PO5 is modern tools. If you are using modern tools and you are using PO5, the must-have is WK6, which is uh, PO on uh, practice oriented. Uh, sorry, on practice uh, engineering practice. So WK6 is engineering practice. So I can still add up some other WK. So in this particular example, I add up WK4. So in PO5, I will have WK4 and I will have also WK6. But I chose to take WP2, WP3, WP4, WP5, WP6 and WP7 for all my computer simulation. Because I may be addressing my computer simulation here for laboratory work. I can also be addressing my computer simulation here for some of the PBL work, maybe some of my final year project work. So therefore, PO5 is there. So if you are making these kind of changes in your alternative assessment, to address the learning outcome that you are dealing with, then you just need to provide with us the gap analysis as to why you do these changes. Basically, the intended learning outcome should not change. Those particular matters should not change. What may change is your alternative assessment from the current assessment. And then again, as I already mentioned earlier on, that will be mentioned in the guiding principle, it must not be compromised. The standard and the quality must not be compromised. And it must be seen equivalent to the current uh, assessment that you have actually normally conduct in your program. Okay, uh, next slide. Yeah, this is the, the, the surprise. Okay, so they are coming up with the new, well, basically it's not new, it's a revised version of the graduate attribute and professional competency. They were looking under the UNESCO uh, and WAFIO working group. So they have actually set up the working group uh, late last year. And they have uh, met in December and basically in January 2020, they have already finalized this matter. And they're looking under these six teams. Accommodate future needs of engineering professionals and the profession. Emerging technologies, so therefore under modern tool usage and whatnot, it will be uh, parked here uh, together under lifelong learning. Emerging and future engineering discipline and practice area, so therefore all the data sciences, this is to accommodate for the 4IR. Incorporate the UN sustainable goal, right? So therefore there will be an uh, assertion to the uh, environment, social, cultural, economic, financial, and global responsibility under our PO, uh, PO7. And then uh, diversity and inclusion include this consideration within ways of working in teams, communication, compliance, environment, legal, etc. systems. And the last one is intellectual agility, creativity, and innovation. So there will be some emphasis on this particular critical thinking. So that will be the basis of the uh, GAPC, the GAPC framework, which I think will be endorsed in 2021. So once it is endorsed, EAC and ETEC will have to rework back our uh, GAPC, our graduate attributes, and we need to be in compliance with uh, what had been uh, discussed and approved by IEA in 2021. Okay, uh, so currently we are still uh, providing feedback to IEA and uh, soon after we will be able to announce what is really the final version of our GAPC. But let me share the next uh, slide. Okay, we will be having WK1 right up to addition of WK9. Prior to this, WK7 was parked as ethics under ethics comprehension. Now, no longer, it will be under ethical attitude and behavior. This is the new WK that is going to be introduced and it will be attached to PO number 8, which is on ethics. 
And then WK8 will now be pushed to lifelong learning. So if we are taking our POs for lifelong learning, now we have to consider WK8 as well. So these are the measures that we need to look at. So investigation will also address WK8. Lifelong learning will also address WK8. So that may take place in 2021. So after June 2021, we should be able to, to, to see this. And I think EAC will have to be proactive on this measure. Okay, next slide. I, uh, okay, basically we are moving into the acculturation of uh, outcome-based education because, uh, for instance, I think, I believe UITM, we started way back in the late 90s and then uh, we were outcome-based education uh, curriculum as early as in the early 2000. So now this is already uh, 2020. So most of our graduates are already out there and they should actually be practicing the outcome-based education that we have already nurtured them while they are in the university. So therefore, I take up that we should be going for acculturation of our outcome-based education. For the new program that is on board, we are their big sisters and big brothers. So therefore, we need to assist them accordingly so that they are also on board with us and we should see this in our society. I think that will be my last slide. Is there any more slide? Yes. Thank you very much, Prof. Zol. And I hope I've already stayed within the 45 minutes that you've already allocated me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Hauer. Well, sorry, I keep calling you Prof. Hauer. It's okay. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Uh, thank you for such an enlightening uh, talk. And there's no better time for this talk then. Sorry, I, I can't hear you very well. Yeah, it's, it's oh, not loud enough. Can you hear me now? Barely. No? Okay. Okay, there's no better time for such a talk like with, on this topic today with the situation that we are in. But of course, uh, we have already reached the end of the semester and I presume whatever we have heard today, we can benefit for the next or coming semester, which probably we will still be uh, doing our ODL for next semester. So this will be very useful, inshallah, for us for the coming semester. So far, we have one question. Are you, Dr. Uh, Ski? The first question is uh, if we record due to connectivity, some of the students are unable to attend during class time. Does that considered as a face-to-face? -face? Say that again, if record? If we record due to connectivity problem, I presume, right? Some of the students are unable to attend during the actual class time. Does that consider as a face-to-face -face session? Okay, the face-to-face -face session would definitely have interaction, right? So we expect anything that we do face-to-face, -face, even if you do online as such, and if you have no problem with connectivity, internet connectivity, and you are capable of getting the questions rightly, and you are capable of discussing it online, that is still considered as face-to-face. -face. It is not just online as in nature, because online, when you, do, when you, when you deal with blended learning, some of the uh, activities are done uh, on webin. Uh, sorry, uh, some of, some of the activities or some of the learning process are done on pre-recorded version, right? For instance, like what we're having now, some of these uh, um, participants are watching the YouTube channel or maybe your FB channel, but they are unable to communicate directly with us. In a sense, unless they are just communicating through the chat room, right? So that particular communication of chat room may not be considered as a full face-to-face, -face, even though they are still asking you questions. There is some interaction happening, but that face-to-face -face activity is not really there. As in compared that we are doing what we're doing now in terms of uh, Zoom or, or Google Meet, and I can still see you on the face and we can still discuss and I can still see your body language 
But for those people who are just doing in you know, a chat room, that is not not possible to to see whether that they are really fully understand or what is really happening. But then again, interaction do happen. It is still dynamic. But to say that it is full on a full um, a face to face, I will not consider as so. The reason being because there are social impact to when we are gathering in in a particular uh, one particular meeting group. Because you will see there will be small discussion happening from from one small group to another group. This activity will not happen. They may happen in the chat, but they may not really physically happen. And and there are some social impact to it as well that you need to really look into. Does that answer the question? Well, I hope so. <laughs> okay, I hope so. The next question uh, we have here is from Uganeshwari Malanyandi. Her question is, what is the maximum student numbers in the group for laboratory work through online learning? Oh, well, we have already mentioned that uh, any laboratory work has to be a maximum of five. That is meant for engineering program. For anything of technology and uh, diploma students, they have to be a uh, smaller number than five. We, we go for three or maximum of four, but we definitely would like to go for three depending on the availability of the equipment and how difficult it is to handle the equipment. But it will not be uh, to have more than three or four for the technology and diploma program. But in terms of when you say that if you want to conduct lab and it, how can you do lab online uh, and how you want to teach lab online by right, we don't teach lab online. Students will have to do their lab. So how does the student do their laboratory work online? Are you giving them some kind of simulation work that need to be done and they need to do it together? And how is that connectivity going to happen between one student to another if it's going to be done online? Teaching would definitely go with what we are doing as well. We're doing in lecture and then maybe probably we do some kind of a case study if they are going to do some kind of a, a discussion. Then it's possible to have it as online discussion. Unless you are saying that you are having an online discussion with your students and uh, if it's going to be done in a group, then it should not be more than five if it's for laboratory session. Okay, the next question I have from uh, Said Jama, Jamal al -Din, Said Hakim. Would you please do some explanation about open-ended questions in the exam? Open-ended questions will definitely be, for instance, if you have, uh, uh, if you utilize uh, WP2. WP2 means range of conflicting requirements, right? So it involves wide range and conflicting technical engineering and other issues. I may be giving some question that may have a very uh, standard uh, opinion for that particular question. But then again, in order to make it range of conflicting requirement, I may add in as what if. What if the depth is now double? What if the length is now half? What if the diameter of the reinforcement is now double? Doubling the diameter doesn't mean that the volume is double, right? So therefore, all of these need to be addressed differently. And you can always make that particular question to be open-ended when you give different variables to each different question, to each different group of students. So they will, will have to address different variables for a different scenario. And when they are coming up with the answer, Definitely, they have to come up with certain assumptions. So your questions will now no longer be standard. You don't have a standardized answer. What you have is the standardized way of arriving to the answer. Not a standard answer that probably you will say that, okay, the SU has to be so-and-so. No. 
probably if they say that they want to double the, the double sorry they want to um, uh, shorten the shorten the, the length of the beam and if they want to uh, double the size of the reinforcement and probably they may use a, a weaker strength concrete rather than going for F30, FCU35 they can go with FCU30 so that would have an implication in the cost you can also ask for what is the cost how do you ensure that it's cost effective? You can first start off with X number of costs and get them to work backwards. That is also an open-ended. Okay? okay? I think we have another question here from the YouTube or Facebook audience. Do we oh, you, really only have, you only have the Facebook ada, YouTube ada, apa lagi? <laughs> IG pun ada. Do we really need to include the WP in all questions in the assessment or only require certain percentage of questions to comply with WP. Okay. That is depending on how the university look at the compliance of WP. Some universities, some program may have certain percentage to be addressed. Because some program may look at uh, the attainment of PO1 for year one will be basic and fundamental. So therefore, you may only address WP in probably 30% of your uh, assessment. The remaining 70% will just go on uh, higher Bloom taxonomy. Okay, But then again, if PO1 is also addressed, in year three and year four, definitely your WP has to uh, increase in terms of the percentage. At EAC, we are not going to look at how many percent you are going to address. What we want to see is do show us the evidences of WP and do show us the evidences of EA. There is no right and wrong. It depends so much on how you want to address your WP and EA. We are giving that flexibility to the universities and uh, how to handle them. But then again, under our EAC standard 2020, we really want to see the WK being evident out, WP evident out, and EA being evident out. So when you are showing us the PO trace or the PO files or whatever, PO booklet or whatever, online PO or whatever, we would like to see where is WP being addressed. That is good enough to us. We will not prescribe how many percent it should be. Okay? That's a very good answer. <laughs> Thank the you. Question, that comes from uh, IRTS, Dr. O. Chai Lian. May I have your opinion on the suitable assessment method or criteria for teamwork in ODL? Oh, you want to ask my opinion for that? I was, I, was, I was trying to get some ideas on how universities are actually dealing with that. OEL. Uh, well, um... Sorry, ODL. Bro. Sorry? ODL. Not ODL. ODL. Oh, ODL. online distance learning. Okay. Well, that, that is really something that I've, I've seen uh, some uh, programs um, what they want the students to show is actually evidences of their WhatsApp discussion. Yeah, well, if, if I am the one who is going to, to deal with it, I would actually require them to do some kind of a Zoom uh, discussion. Because rather than using WhatsApp, why don't they use Zoom? Because the students are getting, I think, 40 minutes free and they can eas easily extend it out. And whatever that they discuss on the Zoom can be recorded and that recorded version can actually be sent to, to the lecturers. And to see, um, that is one way of doing things, yeah. In terms of the discussion for ODL. Other than that, um, I, haven't, I haven't thought so of any other which is more lucrative enough other than uh, this particular uh, video conferencing meeting that they can have among the students themselves. Probably at the end of the day is uh, for you to see on, um, well, uh, there is one universe, one program that actually shared with me what they do is the facilitator, I mean the lecturer, 
would interview the students on on Zoom, probably on Zoom or on Google Meet, uh, and he interviewed all of them, and he asked uh, pertinent questions to the report that they have already submitted. So that is to also check on how the teamwork effort has actually uh, been done throughout the assignment. Okay. Okay, the next question uh, is from uh, Rukaya Ismail. She says, Assalamu alaikum, Prof. Assalamu alaikum. slide, PO versus WP mapping. If you say PO2 is mapped to WK3 and WK4, it's a cost that is mapped to PO2 must have both WKs or can it be only one WK? And other WK is considered in other cost that is also mapped to PO2. Okay, see, when you talk about PO1, when, when you talk about PO1, PO1, when we are looking at WK3 and WK4, WK3 is looking at the engineering fundamentals. Okay, in PO1 alone, it already has the WK1 and WK2. WK1 is on the natural science and WK2 is on mathematics. That is not counted as part and parcel of WP. So WP1 is looking at anything above WK3. So if I would like to address the PO1 to only WK1, I can still go ahead and do that. I don't have to address WK3 and WK4. In the example, I may give you WK3 and WK4, but in the second example of PO2, I may not touch WK3, I'll just only touch WK4. It can also be done in that manner. So long as in between PO1 to PO7, you must address all the eight WKs. Sorry, all the six uh, WKs. Yeah. WK3, WK4, WK5, WK6, WK7, and WK8. Between PO1 to PO number 7. Okay? Okay, we don't have any other question at the moment. So I've got a question to pose you, Prof. Mm -hmm. With your exposure with uh, or meetings with other universities of late, what do you see as some of the main challenges that universities are facing during this uh, pandemic time or pandemic uh, period with regards to what you're talking about today, adherence to complex problems, engineering activities? Okay, um, one of the main issue that um, uh, universities are facing is basically the connectivity of the internet. That means they cannot get 100% of their students connected to the internet. Students may be using their phone and the infrastructure also may not be good. Uh, their notebook also may not be good. So there's a lot of issues in terms of the infrastructure alone. So that's the reason why many of them would still prefer to stay on campus because they know that they can get the connectivity. Now, secondly, lecturers are saying that if they have given certain kind of activity to be done, you may not be able to capture whether really the students are doing it or they are just uh, fulfilling it based on what needs to be done. So most importantly here is to realize how can you really connect with the student? Are you really uh, in contact with your student asking, are you having any problem with the online learning and you understand the online learning because to some student they may not be get they may not be here able to hear your voice properly we don't have to go far even within our own uh, zoom meeting with our own council member some of our council can even you know we are just within within Klein Valley and we see cannot get a proper sound and you will have a lot of issues in trying to understand certain certain matters. Okay. What more if it's with students where you need to share a lot of documents? If you need to share a lot of um, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, pictorial or schematic diagram that need to be uploaded and when you have a weak internet connection then that would be a big issue let me share with you uh, my daughter who has to take uh, her final exam during this MCO period she was given a four hour exam but the duration given to her was 24 hours so from the time from the time she download her examination paper until she upload the examination answers it has to be done within 24 hours even though the examination paper is only four hours and that is showing that they are giving that particular buffer zone for the students to be able to download and upload the answer now have you made any study on whether that kind of facilities can be done in malaysia if our students is not just within our city area if our students is abroad in sabah and sarawak over the sea or probably those who are staying in some remote area we can go as far as pahang they can go to the remote area in Pahang and you still can't get the internet connection right so how are they going to deal with this how do you make arrangement for instance that um, um, diploma student having to do laboratory work and they are already now back home how are they going to do their laboratory work have we made any kind of mutual collaboration with any polytechnics nearby their place so that they can still do the laboratory work for instance Penang and uh, Penang and uh, Sebram Perai Polytechnic, uh, Penang, Polytechnic Sebram Perai dengan uh, UITM uh, uh, Penang and they actually work together and accommodate some other students from other parts that would be able to address this as well so those are the things that you need to, to, to look at and, and you need to also address when you talk about how to go about in identifying the internet connectivity. Now, other than online issues is integrity issues. To the extent that some of them would think that it is best to just give them an uh, exam that is on multiple choice. But then again, how do you really want to control the multiple choice exam? And some lecturers are saying that student has to show the uh, environment by putting up the video on circular mode to see what is the condition in their room that they are staying where is the door so that they will be able to know if the student is leaving uh, the room and students are not allowed to off their video when they are taking the exam that means student must be at all time putting on their video and the lecturer would have to monitor from them if you have 20 students then it's okay but if you have like 231 students like this how can you monitor one after another it's not possible and there's also another uh, whatsapp uh, all other forms of communication that can be done so those the main two issues here is the integrity and the other issues is in terms of the uh, internet connectivity other than that uh, if you want to go with the PBL uh, where you want to go with continuous exam I know there are some places in UK would actually uh, abolish their final exam and just give grades based on their continuous exam on continuous uh, assignment, continuous work. So therefore, that's the grade for them. But uh, I believe for the final year student, they still have to do some PBL before they could actually, even though they could not do the final exam. So that depends so much on how you want to tackle all of this uh, problem with respect to internet connectivity and also with integrity. Okay, that is still good. Another question. <laughs> from uh, uh dr city yeah. 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 can you hear me uh, i think prof zul is saying something 
Uh, Prof. Lu, uh, Prof. Lolita is saying something. Yeah. Can I, can I illustrate what Prof. Siti is uh, saying just now? I'll okay, give yeah. an example. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Uh, in the case of uh, FKE, what we did is uh, just after MCO started, what we did is that we did a table where the students have to fill up their connectivity, the devices that they have, uh, and all that. So what happened is the lecturers will work to will work within students that have the lowest connectivity and the lowest capability. So uh, Zoom is to, for me. In my case, Zoom is totally out because I have so many students in places like Kelantan, Trungano. And therefore, I think uh, we, we need to actually at the start of any of, uh, well, next semester also, we, we will probably ask the student for their profile in terms of their devices, how old their devices are and their connectivity. And then we decide how we, how we work with them online. That is probably the main thing that has to be done. Yeah. That is a good move, actually. That that um, you you really need to to um, get feedback from your students. How is their internet connectivity? Because without a good inter, well, at least at least the minimum level of internet connectivity, then whatever online learning that you are doing will not be able to 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 reach the other end. And and therefore, students, uh, you know, not all students are going to get the. Uh, intended learning outcome that you anticipate them to get. And, and then we have uh, some subjects where uh, in the finals, I mean, they, they're doing exams, as they say, they, they're giving the students six hours. So those are for to take care of students who couldn't get connectivity throughout the whole day. So yeah. the only thing is to be careful of how you phrase your question and how you ask your questions. Yeah. That's good. And I think uh, from Nolida, UITM yes. has already uh, developed, I think, an application that could actually detect our students' degree of connectivity. Yes, yes. Connectivity. So I Correct. think actually now use that application. Yeah, but then that only, uh, that the application was only introduced three weeks ago. Yeah. So, so we couldn't do it. So, yeah. <laughs> We, we did it on the third week of March where we had to work very fast to know how to interact with our, our students and to be fair to every student. So we have, if other faculties uh, 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 would like to have, we have a system called ARIS. So maybe have a look at it. Thanks. Oh, that's great. You can share with them then. Yeah, of course. Of course it's available. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, Pa. We've got another question here. Sure. Mr. Leong can come. Okay, he said, I so thought this is how I plan my continuous assessment. May I get Prof. City Howard's comment on this? Okay. He informed the students about the one hour assessment, that is the progress test, at least a week ago or a week before, duration 1 to 2 p.m. The questions only released at 12.55 p.m. Students need to on their camera online by Microsoft Team or Google Meet so that recording can be carried out by course lecturer. Students are only given five minutes to submit the answer to create through submitting within that of time. This submission will not be answered. Do you understand? <laughs> I, 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 I wouldn't be able to comment in terms of the the, the the rigidity of how you conduct your assessment in that nature to ensure that integrity is is uphold. Um, frankly speaking, I will still give some class to the students. They are adult, they are mature, we expect them to behave as an adult. Uh, but then again, uh, I would be uh, tackling the, the, the matter by providing them with open-ended question, which would be easier for me to uh, tackle. And I think I can reduce the integrity issues to the minimum. And uh, I can really ensure that uh, there will not be any uh, copying from one to another. Uh, 
I will make use of WP2. I can also make use of uh, the other. Uh, uh, WP2 is on the uh, range of completing requirement. Or I can go with WP3, which is depth of analysis required. I can request them to even proceed with some kind of simulation because I'm giving them continuous assignment. Continuous assignment and I can give them up to maybe probably one week or two weeks of work which will require them to do some simulation. Probably the easiest would go to ask them to provide a template uh, using Excel. And then when they submit to me the Excel template, then I will just key in whatever uh, variables that, that could be in. And that could be a, a good way of identifying whether uh, they are doing the right thing or not. Or if there is a copying of Excel template, there are means and ways in how to, to, to look at the, the template. So I think um, um, I wouldn't be so rigid in terms of the time because uh, this connectivity um, issues can happen just at the you know at the prick of finger because uh, you can have blackouts, you can have lots of things, and and it's not it's not really predictable whether you can really have a good uh, connectivity at any time. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't really be able to to really comment whether that is really the right move or not right move. But at the end of the day, uh, you should know better. Uh, you should be able to address your WPs accordingly, and you should be able to address the integrity issues among your students accordingly. Inshallah. I think Prof Nolida got to mute your. Oh, sorry. I forgot about Thank that. You. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, for now, no questions so far. No further questions. Oh, but, that's great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so again, I, I would like to ask your observation so far. Uh, most universities are resorting to actually uh, open ended exams, open book exams, or open ended exams. Why are they actually uh, transferring the assessment to projects and assignments from your position? Okay. Uh if the uh, uh, the final exam or the assessment is now being taken in as a PBL or any kind of case study or open-ended exam, as you mentioned, uh, I would applaud to that. I would applaud that. But then um, the WP component must also, must also be seen in that particular kind of exam. It should not be in a way that, um, you know, it can easily be plugged from the uh, internet and everything is already there. So therefore, the person or the facilitator or the lecturer who is actually preparing the uh, open-ended exam has to be creative themselves. They should be able to look into different sorts of variables that would make their students think rather than just googling certain uh, keywords into the uh, internet and they are given with a such and such answer. Uh, it all goes back to the facilitators or the uh, exam uh, uh, you know, provider. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Prof. Yeah. I think one of the biggest challenges that we see right now is actually developing what? Developing the exam questions. Exactly. The project assignments. Mm -hmm. that would actually incorporate the complex engineering problem as well as the engineering activity. Oh, no, sorry, the complex engineering problems. That is why, I mean, yes, from the question or the assignment, incorporating the elements. Exactly. Another, another part is, of course, the assessment, creating the rubrics that not only that is can be used effectively to measure or test the objective of the climate, for example, but as well as testing the achievement of the complex problem solving skills. I think this is what we are personally observing as one of the biggest challenges. So, any comments on that? Okay, with respect to the uh, preparation of the rubrics, um, I think I have uh, shared earlier on on the uh, rubrics uh, design. Depends on, um, I think uh, recently with Monash, we also shared some uh, rubrics design. 
And what we deal with was to go back on what is the expectation of our WP characteristics and our EA characteristics. So we work backwards based on those characteristics because if you look at all the uh, expectation of the characteristics, they are quite in demand. For instance, like when you see uh, outside problems encompassed by standards and codes of practice for professional engineering, that means looking at WP5. So how do you address WP5 rubrics? Are you just looking at what kind of uh, standards and codes of practice for professional engineering are you looking at? So we really have to give a deep thought on what kind of code of practice. Are we just going to look at the normal code of practice that we have? Probably, we have, for instance, like in Monash, they are the students actually being taught using the Australian standard. So we were saying, if you want to use WP5 as part an element of your measurement in your WP, why don't you get the students to now design using the Euro code or even to look at some of the Malaysian standards? Because students will be working in Malaysia. Their learning is all based on the Australian standard. So those are evidences of how they can actually move on. But then again, how do you want to translate all of this in your rubrics? So rubrics must really be designed together. Probably it is not possible to just design by a person. So you really need to work in a team. So I think, uh, I think the faculty has like four main uh, division, four main center of learning. So therefore, you can actually create the rubrics in that nature based on the studies, based on the center of studies. So then it can always relate back to the WP's component. And that can be used in terms of the uh, uh, basis as to how you can go for the rubrics so that you can uh, measure the intended learning outcome that need to be measured. And I think uh, Dr. Liu has also come up with some presentation of papers and then he has published some papers in terms of rubrics that can also be, be seen. And I think uh, I will share that with Dr. Mazda for those kind of rubrics and then we can actually share with you guys. Thank you, Prof. Okay, sure. PM Sol, I just want to um, uh, read something from the uh, Facebook. Uh, there's a compliment eh, from Engineer Chu. Uh, good sharing, Dr. Engineer City. It will help the child to strengthen their understanding in this subject. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think that is Chu Beng Lai. I think he's one of the panel. He's one of the industry panel that is very proactive. He has been joining all of these uh, uh, webinars uh, for himself to understand what is actually WP, what is EA, and that's very good. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, already almost. Please eleven forty-five. Unless anyone has anything to ask, we can actually reach or stop our seminar or webinar today. So, any other questions? Last minute. Anyway, Doctor Vicky, I totally agree with you. Uh, for those who are having difficulty or challenges in creating the 10 questions and the assignments, we actually fulfill the complex problem requirement. We can actually look at the WPs that they are actually addressing and they can work backwards. Yes. They can be very creative. Yeah. Right? Exactly. That's very true. And I think for, for everyone, we would like to share that our committee, our co complex problem committee in UITM, we are actually compiling, compiling the uh, project and assignments that we have moderated to make sure that they are fulfilling the complex problem requirements and also helping lecturers to, to actually develop effective uh, assessment rubrics. And we're compiling all this in, in hopefully in a book and we hope to publish it by October, hopefully. And hopefully this can help many of us to look at examples of how uh, this thing can be done. Although uh, different fields or different areas, the topics might be different, but I think the concept remains the same. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Very good. And okay. we would like to invite Prof Howard to be our editor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's uh, it. One last question here. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Siti Howard, I would like to ask your opinion on changing the assessment from 60% annual assessment, sorry, 60% annual exam and 40% continuous assessment with 30% test, 30% assignment. One, thirty percent of time and two, and ten percent quiz during COVID nineteen. Well, uh, as already mentioned, any alternative only any alternative assessment that is to be undertaken by the university by the program must undergo the internal QMS. If the internal QMS is happy with you not having any final exam, everything is to be done on PBL, everything is to be done on the uh, um, uh, continuous assessment, test one, test two, and test three, that's fine. But then again, just be caution, CPC must still be adhered to. CPC means the condition for passing courses. Yeah? Even though you're not having any final exam, that's fine with us. But visual CPC is being adhered to. Under EAC, which is different with ETEC and uh, with, with, uh, which is different with the technology and the diploma program, under EAC, we have CPC, condition for passing courses. So if you don't have any final exam, then how do you ensure that students really attain to the level of that particular learning outcome? I just need to caution you that. I'm not saying that you can't do it, you can. You definitely can. You just want to go with test one, test two, and test three. But what is the level of your test one? What is the level, the depth and breadth of your test one? What is the depth and breadth of your test two and test three? So just be in mind, bear, bear in mind that uh, we need to, to, to cater for the uh, CPC and the WPs. As long as, as long as you work backwards and you want to do your continuous assessment using the WP component, I think you're already there. You have, not, you have nothing to worry about not having any final exam. That's fine. That's okay. Yeah? Dr. Siti? Yes? I think, uh, thank you, Dr. Siti. I think we've reached right, okay. the end of our webinar. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I thank you for spending time with us. And I hope you will uh, be able to join us again sure. in our upcoming uh, webinar series. Okay. No problem. All of you who are uh, in this uh, session today, we also welcome you to join us in our future webinar series where we'll go into more detail into the implementation of. Uh, complex problem solving and engineering activities in teaching and learning and uh, assessment methods. So, to all of you, I thank you again for spending your time to join us in this webinar session this morning. So, for those of you who wish to get your e certificate for your attendance, please do register and please also fill up this short survey that we have prepared for you. This will be very helpful for us to make an uh, assessment of where we are right now with respect to the topic that we're talking about. Uh, I think that is about it for today. Yeah. Okay. Congratulations to the faculty. Congratulations to all the team. And it's nice to be able to share with the session with UITM. Alhamdulillah. You know, after three years. <laughs> Sekejap je masa berlalu, Prof. Tiga tahun. Oh yes, uh, well the, the three years that I leave uh, the university has been very enriching and Alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy, Alhamdulillah. And it's good to be back just even though just to share this particular session. So um, looking forward to more of uh, UITM members to be on board uh, EAC and ETEC and really welcome uh, all of you here. And uh, please do join us uh, on our upcoming uh, training of the new panel. So I think especially uh, the young ones uh, and not so young ones, that's fine. 
uh, because we do have some of those who are actually uh, going into retirement and now they feel that they have the time that they can accommodate and they come in for our upcoming training. They've already registered for our upcoming training. Inshallah, our upcoming training should be in uh, November, I think. November, October or November. Just, just keep track of that. Inshallah. Yeah, Prof Zul, you are invited in as well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank I'm you very much. So many Thank you, Prof. That other people have on their mind. And I think we'll proceed with more of these sessions. They will be very yeah. useful for all of us. Yeah. Okay, thank you again to everyone. Okay, thank you. Terima kasih, Sister. Yeah, Assalamualaikum. Okay, terima kasih, Prof. Bye. See you. Okay.